Ricky, that was beautiful. I'll be praying that your voice holds out for, what, 10 more? <laughs> Thank you for that. Let's, let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Lord Jesus, you are the word made flesh. And now we ask you, who are the living word, to speak to us through your written word. Break through the things that might be in our way. And speak what we need to hear. We pray it in your name. Amen. Christmas is such a fun time, even when, especially when you're young, but even when you get older. My kids are mostly grown now, so it's mostly gift cards and cash, and some of the magic is gone, you know? But we still have fun. My wife and I, were, we still lock our bedroom door and wrap all the presents, you know? And I, I, I don't know how you are, but when I, go, I like to just go out and just buy stuff. Like, okay, just get some of this, some of that. I don't really count. I don't really try to keep it fair. My wife is more meticulous, has lists, and so I come home with a bunch of bags, and it ruins her plan. And she's like, what? She, we, it's the same. You'd think 25 years of marriage, we'd stop doing this. We do the same thing every year, every year. And I find myself in this like out-of-body experience going, oh, I did it again. We did it again. Here we are again having the same discussion, you know, counting, stacking, wrapping. Um, and, then, and then, of course, I want to just wrap them. Any guys like this? Just wrap them. Any guys help wrapping? I can wrap pretty good. I'm pretty good with the neat corners. But I don't really care like, if it all matches with the tree and the decor. They're all going to rip it open anyway. My wife has plans for that too. We do the same thing every year. I buy too many gifts. I mess up the plan. And I wrap stuff in an inappro inappropriate way. So anyway, went through that last night. And here we are. <laughs> Part of the joy of the season is all the buildup and anticipation. I, get, I know what that's like. And our culture does this, which starts really early. And we could play a little word association game like the kids did up here. What do you look forward to? What do you associate with Christmas? And they, they have their, it's the same thing every year, right? Presents, presents. A couple of you moms say, oh, say Jesus, say Jesus. And the kids say, Jesus, you know, family. Lights, cookies. I've been saving up my calories all year. I'm going crazy tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we do the same thing. But what is it we really look forward to or anticipate at Christmas season? All the wonderful things, they're good as far as they go. You're probably thinking, well, we're in church, so we'll say what the kids said. I want to share with you one single verse, not always read at Christmas time, that I think gets right at the heart of what it is we celebrate, why we gather. If this is more than just a cultural tradition for you, this is more than just a once a year, put on your crazy sweater, go because mom wants you to. And I know for some of you that's why you're here. But if it's more, I'm going to share just one verse which gets right at the heart of what Christmas is. We've been in a series called Light of the World. You've heard that theme mentioned. We've been exploring John chapter 1, the first 14 verses, which is really the prologue to John's whole gospel. He lays out why Jesus came, what it's all really about. And that prologue finishes with verse 14. That's the verse I want to focus on, just one verse. John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the verse, this last verse. We have seen his glory, John says. The word, and if you're with us, you know that the word there it means is the Greek word logos. It means divine first principle, like the ground of being, the essence of all that exists. That's the Greek philosophical term. And John's saying there is a divine first principle, but it's not a philosophy you subscribe to. It is a person, a personal God. He's the logos, the word. And that personal God is not far off and lofty and high and removed. He is present. So present, in fact, he became flesh. And in becoming flesh, we see something that we could not otherwise see. Glory, he says. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Some of you will know this. The word dwelt there is the, is the root Greek word for the Hebrew word tabernacle. There's so, every word in this verse is just pregnant with meaning. Word, flesh, tabernacled, Glory, grace, truth. Maybe someday we'll say, well, kids, what do you look forward to? They'll say, tabernacled, right? Flesh. No, I doubt it. I want to focus on two words, just two words of one verse. The words are flesh and glory. 
We, we could spend a sermon on every one of these words. We don't have time for that. Flesh and glory. These two words together are the essence of what Christmas is all about. We'll try to unpack that. But they're not words we associate with each other very often. The Greek word for flesh is the word sarx. The Latin version of this is the word carne. Anybody have chili con carne? Right? Con meaning with, carne meat, God with meat, right? That's what it literally means. God with flesh on. God con carne. Literally. It's not, we hear it, we think the word became flesh, and we think it sort of, it sort of soars above our heads as this Christmas Eve or this biblical phrase. It's an earthy phrase. Flesh. Anybody ever been in the backside of a butcher shop? Seen how they process the cuts of meat? Remember the first time I ever went deer hunting and saw a deer field dressed? I'm not much of a hunter, but I've been a few times. Not, a, not an experience you associate with glory. I mean, I suppose if you're really a meat eater, you might say, that New York strip steak was glorious. I don't know, maybe you'd say that. But we don't typically associate flesh and glory together. But John puts them together in this verse for a very important reason. The word became flesh. And there's a wide range for the word, meaning of the word in the New Testament, but most often it means, you know, flesh. The, the meat of an animal or your flesh, my flesh. And from a human perspective, this is what we call the incarnation, but the human perspective, uh, the incarnation is a terrible idea. I mean, really, think about it for a minute. If God's plan to save the world was to come in the flesh, incarnate, there's that root Latin word incarnate, it's a bad idea. It's a terrible idea. The mortality rate of infants in ancient Rome was over 30%. That means the, the baby, the God baby, the God child, had a better than one in three chance of not making it to his first birthday from a human perspective. It's a huge risk, huge vulnerability. Not to mention the crazy, desperate King Herod who tries to kill him before he turns one as a toddler. Uh, add to that that disease was rampant. I mean, human infants are among the most vulnerable creatures on the planet when they're born. A horse will, st a baby colt, a horse will stand in an hour and walk within two. How long does it take a child? An infant baby. And if your babies come out of the womb and stand in an hour, that'd be crazy, right? Why is gifted, right? Walk into, no, it takes a year. If you're my children, you're just exceptional. It's 10 months, whatever, right? But we are, the, we, are, we are among the most vulnerable and weak of all creatures. That's how God decides to do it? The world is in darkness. The world is broken. The world needs help. What's the plan? I know. I'll become the weakest of the weak, the most vulnerable thing. What, what risk he took? And on top of that, the mortality rate, the weakness, the vulnerability, the riskiness, who's going to believe this? I mean, God, who's going to believe this idea? I talk to people sometimes who will say things like, you know, the whole God becoming like a virgin birth and becoming a baby and the resurrection from the dead, I, you know, I think those are, I don't know what I believe about that, but it doesn't really matter. The story has power and meaning to me and because doctrine doesn't really matter. What matters is that you just live a good life. Maybe some of you believe that. I understand that sentiment. But even that statement, doctrine doesn't really matter. What matters is that you live a good life. That's a doctrine. What you're saying is, it doesn't matter what you believe. It matters how you live. That's it, that you're putting forth a position. The message of Christmas is that it does matter. It matters infinitely. <laughs> I have a running debate with a friend of mine of what is the, the, he's a pastor in a different part of the country, what's the more important miracle? It's a dumb debate, but it's what pastors do for fun. Is it the incarnation, God becoming man, or is it the resurrection, God rising from the dead? We go back and forth, and I always say it's the resurrection. Paul said, if Christ is not raised, your faith is useless, and so is, and you're still in your sins. And he says, but if there's no incarnation, we don't even get there. There is no resurrection. And I think he's right. Don't tell him I said that. 
If there's no incarnation, if God does not be, inhabit flesh, there's no meaningful resurrection. The incarnation, though it's hard to get our heads around, it makes sense of everything that comes after in the New Testament. It's the necessary thing. From a human perspective, it sounds ridiculous. But this is kind of the message of John 1. We're not to see it from a human perspective. I want you to not see, to see it from a different perspective this Christmas. God does not do things from a human perspective, and we should be eternally grateful that he doesn't. Where would we be if God operated according to what we thought was best, what made sense to us? In fact, John says we have seen his glory. We've seen it. Different perspective. And it's not the kind of glory you think. I don't know what comes in your mind when you hear the word glory. Most people think shiny things. You ever notice the old paintings of the, of the, of the nativity scene? They have Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the, and the wise men, which that's historically inaccurate. They wouldn't be there yet. But anyway, they're all gathered around. And there's the manger. And what's coming out of the manger? It's always glowing, isn't it? Like radiant, like Jesus was a nuclear baby. Like he had a, a reactor in there. Like there's like light shining out of it always. And it's sort of sanitized and it looks nice. We think of glory and they, they all have halos. It looks so nice. Can you imagine what it smelled like to be in a manger with animals? Those of you who have seen birth, it's not clean. It's not, it's flesh, earthy. We just sang a song, the Hark the Herald Angels Sing, right? There's a, a verse in that song. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Remember that line? We just sing it. We don't, we just, sometimes you just sing words, you don't even think what they mean. Hail the incarnate deity. He uses the word veiled. John Wesley wrote that hymn. Veiled in flesh. Veiled usually means you can't see something. If there's a veil, it's obscured, right? But... It's brilliant theology, what Wesley does. He says, veiled in flesh makes us see it. You go out and you stare on a sunny day, stare at the sun, that's a bad idea, right? You're going to have, you're going to be at least blinking for a while. You might damage your retinas. You can't stare right at the sun. What do you need? You need a filter. You need a veil. You need sunglasses or something to look through. This is what, if, we, if you, you can't stare right at the glory of God, it would burn out your spiritual retinas. <laughs> like it would overwhelm you. We need a filter. What's the filter? The flesh. God in flesh. It's in flesh we see glory. We, we can't know what God is like otherwise. We can have approximations and ideas and theological thoughts, but he's made himself known in flesh. The message of Christmas is that God thought it's worth the risk to make himself known so that you and I could see. Could see him. Behold him. Grasp him in a way that you can't, could not otherwise. And, and by the way, the word glory, this is the Greek word doxa. The Hebrew word is kavod. Uh, it means, we think of glory, like I said, shiny, bright, but the word literally means weight or significance, heaviness. If somebody really important walks in the room, the room sort of relationally tips in their direction, doesn't it? There's a weight, a significance to who they are. So what is John saying? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in doing that, we see his significance. The weight of who he is. I wanted to share with you briefly three things that I think the incarnation there's many things, but three things that you could take away from here today, ponder, think about, tuck them away in your heart, pray about, that the incarnation gives to you, makes possible, why it matters. Let me read to you a quote from C.S. Lewis's essay called The Grand Miracle. Lewis says, the Christian story is precisely the story of one grand miracle. This Christian assertion being that what is beyond all space and time which is uncreated, eternal, came into nature, into human nature, descended into his own universe, and rose again, bringing nature up with him. This is the grand miracle. The Christian story is precisely that God, who's beyond space and time, made all that exists, comes into that which he made in the most vulnerable position for one purpose, to redeem, restore, and bring it up with him. 
Here's the three things. First, the incarnation tells you what God is like. You could not know him if he did not make himself known. And the message of Christmas is he has made himself known. Well, what's he like? Well, for one thing, God is not immune or aloof or indifferent to our suffering, to your struggle. I hear people say things like, well, you know, who knows? We can't know why, we, why there's evil and suffering in the world. We can't, just can't know. We just have to trust that God knows. I understand that, but that doesn't go quite far enough. The incarnation says, whatever God's reasons for allowing relative suffering for a time, it cannot be because he doesn't care or he isn't aware. Because he entered into it. He suffered like we suffer. God himself got involved he involved himself. Number two, it tells us that you can be forgiven. The incarnation tells you you can, we usually associate that with crucifixion and resurrection, but the incarnation, God becoming flesh, tells you that you can be forgiven. The resurrection makes no sense if there isn't a physical incarnation. There can't be a physical resurrection or a physical death for that matter. The baby in the manger is going to the cross. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus, who was in very nature God, did not consider his position as something that he had to hold on to, but emptied himself, surrendered it, laid it down. Why? So that he could take on the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's why he came. J.I. Packer, I think all great writers have two initials for a first name. But mine are JJ, so it's not going to work. He writes, the Christmas message is that there is hope for a ruined humanity. Hope of pardon. Hope of peace. Hope of peace with God. Hope of glory. Because at the Father's will, Jesus Christ became poor and was born in a stable so that 30 years later he might hang on a cross. It is the most wonderful message the world has ever heard or will ever hear. The incarnation tells you what God is like and it tells you that you can be forgiven. And finally, maybe most importantly, it tells you you're not alone. If it's a myth, if it's just another sentimental thing you feel at Christmas time, then you're on your own in this life. You think about that? If it's just a song you sing or it's just a story with some sort of, you know, moral to it, then you are on your own. But the message of Christmas, of John 1.14, is that you're not on your own. What does Matthew 1.23 say? The virgin shall be with child, give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means, say it with me, God with us. That's it. God's plan from the garden to the tabernacle to the temple to the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost to the end of the story has always been to be with us. But let's be honest, we're not easy to be with. We're difficult people to be with. We, don't, we reject him. We go our own way. We ignore, we exploit and snub and, and mistreat each other. And God will not give up on his desire to be with us. That's what Christmas tells you. Think of the lengths he went, the sacrifice he made to be with you. In fact, do you know how the story ends? The story of the Bible? Revelation 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be no more mourning, crying, nor pain, for all the former things have passed away. It begins in the garden with us. We screw it up, and we're still screwing it up. But God is relentless in his desire to be with us. He wanted that so badly that he would come into the world as one of us. And the whole story is headed toward the day when he will be with us. Now, it's one thing to say that God can be with you. But I want you to hear this. He wants to be with you. God deeply desires to be with you. Present with you. Close to you. Some of you can't wait to be with family. Some of you can't wait till that's over, right? If we're honest. God longs to be with you. 
And maybe it's been a long time since you've been with him. Maybe you've drifted. Maybe you've never been. But if you hear nothing else this Christmas season, I hope you leave with this tucked in your heart. That the God of the universe made you, loves you, came in the world as one of us, died for you, rose for you, and desperately desires to be with you. Think of the lengths he went to be with you. What lengths would you go to be with him? This is God, our Emmanuel. The Word became flesh, flesh and blood, and dwelled with us. Why? So we'd see what he's really like, so we'd know we're forgiven, and so we'd know we're not alone. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the way that you pour out your blessing in our lives, and we take that for granted, we ignore it, we doubt it. But here together on this Christmas service, impress on our hearts that you not only want to be with us and can be with us, you are with us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name.